Hi everyone. Um, in this video, we're going to be looking at Stuart and Condor commercial insulation. Okay. Um, and this case um, predominantly concerns uh, remoteness principles. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay. All right. So in this case, Stuart was contracted to provide insulation under a government program called SANIP, which was the Sydney Aircraft Noise Insulation Program. Um, so some of the services were outsourced. So they hired a subcontractor, uh, Condor, as well as I think it was seven other subcontractors to install um, this insulation. Uh, the defendant, however, breached the specifications um, of the insulation. They didn't put a box around um, downlights, which then meant that the insulation um, in an unusual but not unexpected event, something similar to that it says in the facts, um, in an unusual event, the insulation caught fire and then caused damage to a house. Um, as a result um, of that fire, the SANIP actually terminated the contract with Stuart. So the head contract was cancelled on the basis that Stuart had failed to supervise um, the job site correctly. So essentially that they failed to pick up this issue with the downlights. Um, yeah. So here they sought to recover loss of future profits from Condor because obviously Condor's failure to meet the specifications had resulted in that being um, the contract being terminated. Um, now here, the head contract that they had with SANIP didn't actually provide for additional future contracts. So that was outside um, the terms of contract. There wasn't any options in there um, for more contracts. However, it was, you know, on the facts, it was reasonably um, possible, I guess, uh, that if they did a good job, they'd then get further contracts. Okay. Um, so yeah, so they sought the loss of future profits for a contract that they didn't necessarily have, if that makes any sense. Okay, so the key issue um, that arose on the facts then was whether Condor was liable for the loss of future contracts. So was the consequences of the breach of contract reasonably contemplated by the parties at the time they entered into the contract? Um, and this in particular dealt with, or the issue that arose was in particular in relation to the second limb of Hadley and Baxendale, um, which is the limb where um, uh, the losses arising were in the reasonable contemplation of the parties because of special circumstances known to the parties. Now, remembering that the first limb of Hadley and Baxendale being that they're the losses that are naturally arising from the breach of contract. Now here, the losses naturally arising from the breach of contract um, would have been the loss of profits, I guess, for that contract that, um, uh, what was it, Stuart, were actually at that time involved with, with Sadie, or potentially the, um, uh, the losses caused by the fire itself. But yeah, so here, this loss of future contracts was not within that natural course arising. So the question was whether it was a special circumstance known to the parties that therefore made that loss naturally, or not naturally, sorry, reasonably contemplated. And it was ultimately held that these losses were outside the second limb of Hadley and Baxendale. So these loss of future profits um, weren't uh, were too remote. They weren't reasonably contemplated by the parties and there was a raft of reasons given why, which we'll deal with in the case reading guide. Alrighty. So in terms of the case reading guide, so the first question is what loss was the appellant claiming in this case? So here they were claiming expectation um, damages based on the profit it would have earned if SANIP had not terminated its contract with the appellant plaintiff. Okay, so what was the breach committed by Condor that resulted in Stewart's contract with SANIP being terminated? Um, so here the breach was of a specification, a building specification standard um, that was incorporated into um, Stewart's head contract. Oh no, sorry, the, the contract between Stewart and Condor. Um, and that was the requirement that downlights would not be covered with insulation unless the downlight was boxed, okay? And here Condor insulated five downlights in her house without boxing them. 
um, and then the um, insulation ignited and the fire broke out, um, which damaged the house. Okay. And the reason why St. Imp actually terminated its contract with Stuart was because it had failed in its duty of supervision of Condor. All right. So in terms of the next question, so what are the two limbs of the rule in Hadley and Baxendale for determining whether a loss resulting from a breach of contract um, is compensable or too remote? So the first limb um, is if the loss arises naturally according to the usual course of things. And the second limb is if the damage that is supposed to have been in the contemplation um, uh, of both parties at the time they made the contract. Um, yeah. So the second limb is to do with the, spe the special circumstances and known to the parties that bring the loss within the reasonable contemplation of them. And the first, whether it's just a loss naturally arising, such as loss of profit of the actual contract, not potential future contract. Okay, so here, the, it was the second limb um, that was the key issue. Um, in terms of the next question, so how did Lord Reid in Kufos, Kufos uh, reformulate the remoteness uh, rule for contract damages. Um, now, in this case, uh, this case brought together those two limbs of Hadley and Baxendale and stated them just as one general overarching principle. Okay, um, and the quote from the case that's relevant I've got here. So, the crucial question is whether on the information available to the defendant when the contract was made, he, they, or a reasonable person, not man, okay, I'm gender neutralizing this language, um, whether they or a reasonable person in, that, in their position would have realized that such a loss was sufficiently likely to result from the breach of contract. Okay, which is essentially restating the test to be what I've got on the slide here. So compensation will only be payable for those damages um, which the defaulting party could fairly be regarded as having contemplated and have been willing to accept as a risk of default at the time the contract was made. Okay, and when we think about that risk of default, that ties into the factors that um, are in the last case reading question. Yeah, which I'll come back to. Um, in terms of the next question, so is the test of remoteness in contract wider or narrower than the test in tort? How is the contract test justified by the court? Now, there's quite a few statements in this Stuart and Condor case around the nature of the test of remoteness in contract, okay? And these statements, such as the one at um, paragraph 50 and the one at uh, 118, they state that the remoteness test is narrower in contract than in tour. And, and it makes sense because you can pair the two phrasings. So you've got reasonable contemplation in contract and reasonably a reasonable foreseeability in tort. So it's possible for something to be foreseeable that isn't actually reasonably contemplated by the parties at the time of entering into the contract. Okay, so the test of remoteness in contract is um, narrower um, than in tort. Okay, um, what else do I have here in my notes? In contract, loss is too remote if its likelihood was not within the contemplation of the parties, of the defendant, sorry, both parties, defendant, um, at the time of contracting. So this means that damages are less likely to be too remote in tort than in contract. Um, yeah, and I've just got here implicitly, um, this position would be justified on the basis that compensation under contract should be limited to the risks assumed on the basis um, the risk assumed under the contract, sorry. And then that, you know, makes sense when you consider that contract damages include to ex in oh, start again. Contract damages extend to include expectation damages um, by, based on the hypothetical performance of the contract. So if these extended to damages that were reasonably foreseeable as well, it would lead to um, unjust results then. Now, in terms of the final question then, which is to do with the factors that might be relevant to remoteness in contract or that were in this case relevant to whether um, the loss was within um, the reasonable contemplation of the parties because of those special circumstances, okay, going back to Hadley and Baxendale. Um, 
Now, the loss claimed um, in the case was not a risk, so that, that loss of future um, potential contracts um, was not a risk that the defendant is likely to un have undertaken um, because although it knew of the existence of the head contract between Stewart and Sainip, it would not have contemplated or assumed the risk that a breach of its contract with Stewart would result in the termination of Stewart's contract with Sainip. Okay? Um, and the relevant factors um, that go to that um, are listed on the slide here, some of the examples. So, you know, the supervision of works was the responsibility of Stuart, okay? Um, Condor had a number of individual contracts with Stuart, but no contractual right to any ongoing relationship. Um, also, the contract price between um, Condor and Stuart was quite low, being I think 10,000 a contract, 10,000 a house maybe? Yeah, probably 10,000 a house. Um, and then they, the court saw this as out of all proportion to the risk of being liable for the damages um, for the loss of the entire contract um, between Stuart and Sainab. So there are some of the factors um, that were relevant there. All right, so I shall leave this one for you. Yeah. But yeah, just keep in mind when looking at remoteness, we do talk about that test in Hadley and Baxendale as having two limbs. Um, but remember that that test has been reformulated in places like Kufos um, to just be that one overarching test. Okay, so you'd need to mention both if you potentially got this in a hypothetical. All right, I'll stop there. All right, thanks guys.